Meeting of the Board of Regents of the Tech Tech University System is now called to order. The board will continue in open session and meet as a committee of the whole and a meeting of the board. Chancellor Duncan, President May, President Skubanek, President Mitchell, and President Lang, will you please present your introductions and recognitions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, uh, recognize one of our own leaders. Uh, university systems are made up of great leaders, and the first person I want to recognize today is Dr. Rick Lang. Uh, as many of you may know, Dr. Lang was appointed as panel chair for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration System Device Panel. The panel reviews and evaluates data about the safety and effectiveness of marketed and investigational medical devices for the use in circulatory and vascular systems. Then they make the appropriate recommendations to the FDA commissioner. Dr. Lang, who is still a practicing cardiologist, has served on the panel since 2010. His term as chair will last four years. This is a pivotal time for Dr. Lang to serve as chair. The FDA is going through important changes, including efforts to move drugs and devices through the approval process faster, especially uh, for breakthrough devices like, like this panel, ones like this panel reviews. Uh, I know Dr. Lang and all of our presidents continue to emerge as leaders in each of their fields in a national way. So real proud of this. And I know you'll, I'm glad that Rick Lang is doing that uh, as a person who now is about 65 years old and those vascular system things probably need a little more <laughs> things moving to the market uh, to be very good. So please join me in congratulating Dr. Lang on this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the next person I want to uh, recognize uh, needs no introduction, but his name is Dr. Brian May, who's the president of Angelo State University, and his team. Uh, Dr. May and the team uh, secured their highest fundraising year in history. They've currently raised $26.8 million. That's a significant milestone for a uh, comprehensive regional university like Angelo State. Uh, is probably, one of the, I think, one of the top, or is, is not the top institution uh, of its peers in the state, if not this region of the country. And we're real proud of what they do. His team is really, really uh, significant. Uh, yesterday, you approved a gift for $5.5 million from the Cybel Foundation of Galveston for help on the dorm. So a lot of good things are going on at Angelo State University and throughout our system. This is the end of the year, and um, I know uh, I want to congratulate Texas Tech Health Science Center and Dr. Mitchell, Kendra, and your team as well for uh, your fundraising uh, year uh, and meeting your fundraising goal for, by over, by, or of over 18 million. And Dr. Skubnik and his team and many of the great things that they brought to us uh, this year. Uh, looks like this may be a year of about 160 million, uh, which is a, a very good year for, for the Texas Tech University system. And that happens because of not, it happens because of a lot of people who do a lot of work every day, get up every day trying to with a plan to do something good for Texas Tech and for our donors and alums who contribute significantly to, uh, to the Texas Tech system uh, institutions. Um, finally, uh, last but not least, I would ask John Huffaker to stand, please. After a long, rich career, John Huffaker announced his retirement at the start of the summer. Sadly for all of us, this will be his last board meeting. Maybe not sadly for him, we don't know. <laughs> After more than six years as vice chancellor, his last day at the system will be August 31st. Prior to his appointment as vice chancellor, uh, John Huffaker served three years on the Board of Regents, where he was chairman of the Finance Administration Committee, vice chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Carr Scholarship Foundation, and a member of the Audit Committee. Uh, prior to joining the system, Mr. Huffaker was an attorney and shareholder in the Amarillo law firm of Sprouse, Schrader, and Smith, PC. A native of Tohoka, Mr. Huffaker is a proud Red Raider, earning both his bachelor and law degree from Texas Tech. While in law school, he served as editor-in-chief of the Texas Tech Law Review and graduated as a member of Order of the Coif. Highest honor that you, you can graduate uh, from law school. Highest academic honor. In addition to his accomplished law career, Mr. Huffaker has dedicated much of his time to supporting higher education and the students of West Texas, not only through his time on the board, but uh, also as past chair of the Amarillo College Board of Regents and founding president of the Amarillo Area or Amarillo Education Foundation. He served many years as a member of the Texas Tech uh, Law School Foundation Board of Trustees, and he's so well thought of that they actually have named a seminar after him. It's the John Huffaker Agricultural Law Seminar. I attended that this, 
you're to get my CLE, and it's one of the, I think one of the best. Uh, and I know you're on the planning committee of that. But it's one of the one of the best CLE programs that uh, that I've uh, encountered in a long time. So I want to congratulate you on that. But I think we all want to congratulate John Huffaker on a fine job he's done for us as council, member of the board, and as a proud alum of Texas Tech University. Chancellor, you, you may have mentioned it, and I didn't hear it, but he was also a saddle tramp. That's right. <laughs> John, uh, for many of you, last night we had a, a kind of a special function at the Burkhart Center where we got to toast and honor John, but certainly would love on behalf of the Board of Regents to just share how much he has meant to this board. He served with us as one of our peers and was really an outstanding regent. Uh, he gave us a lot of insight, a lot of knowledge, and then as he had, we had the opportunity to have John become part of the system, uh, he continued as someone who has been in our shoes to give us that sage advice and to really help guide the system over these years. And so we owe you an incredible debt of gratitude and we are happy that you're going on to the next part of your life. I know you're excited about it, uh, but you will truly be missed here, and, and we know you'll stay in touch, but you've, you've made your mark and made a difference on your watch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <clears throat> the Chairman Francis, um, I have three introductions to make today. The first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Carol Sumner. Uh, she is our new Vice President of the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and she assumed this new role, this role on June 18th. Uh, she has an extensive career in higher education and was most recently the Senior Associate Dean of Students at Arizona State University. At Arizona State University, she led the University Academic Success Programs, uh, part of a university-wide uh, unit providing services and initiatives supporting academic success and retention. She also led the culture at ASU, which identifies and celebrates a diverse and multifaceted university culture. Um, when Carol, when Dr. Sumner took this job, within the first week, um, she was faced with a very difficult <coughs> situation that required her um, very intense involvement and leadership. And she displayed the leadership skills that we recognized during her interview process, and I couldn't be more pleased to have her as part of the Texas Tech University leadership team. Carol, welcome to Texas Tech and Lubbock, Texas. Those are great colors, by the way. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Adling. Uh, Jennifer Adling is our chief procurement officer. She's a 1999 graduate of Texas Tech. In her role, she oversees purchases, purchasing and contract, payment services, travel, vendor services, and property surpluses. Uh, this involves millions of dollars of transactions. And in um, testament to the excellent job she does, Jennifer in the procurement services department received the award of excellence from the National Association of Educational Procurement. She and her team uh, carry out these services in efficient and expeditious ways that is so essential to the function of our university. Congratulations and thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> and finally, I would recognize Madeline Lockhart. Madeline is a junior here at Texas Tech majoring in physics and mathematics. She was chosen as a Goldwater Scholar in this, this past spring, only one of 211 throughout the United States. She is also a National Merit Scholar and a member of President Select. She plans to pursue a doctorate in nuclear physics and then dedicate her career to research in nuclear safeguards. 
Uh, when she's home in Los Alamos, New Mexico, she works at Los Alamos National Laboratory in the area of nuclear engineering and nonproliferation. We're very proud of you, Madeline, and congratulations. Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't have anyone in, in presence today, but I do want to recognize two individuals that have been instrumental here at Angelo State in the recent. Uh, the first one is Scott Wisniewski. He is an Angelo State alum and a former member of the men's basketball team. He came to Angelo State from Chicago, Illinois, where he was playing at the YMCA, he was discovered by a, a gentleman there and was related to our basketball coach. Came to play at Angelo State and has been an incredibly successful entrepreneur upon graduation. He just recently gave us a million dollars for an endowed chair in entrepreneurship in the college, the Norris Vincent College of Business, and that makes our second chair in the College of Business. And um, we are really proud of him and, and what he's been able to do. And he uh, graduated with his uh, business degree at Angelo State and stayed in San Angelo and hires a number of people there in San Angelo. I'd also like to recognize another alum of Angelo State, Mark Lowe. He graduated from Angelo State and in the, from the College of Business as a, with an accounting degree, went on to become the owner of Juno Energy, and he too has given us a million dollars for an endowed chair in accounting uh, professor and uh, for the Norris Vincent College of Business, and that makes our, our third chair in the College of Business. And so we're extremely proud of Mark Lowe. He's been... He's come back many times. He grew up in San Angelo. He now resides in Dallas, Texas. But Scott Wisniewski and Mark Lowe are really important. And it con continues to baffle me that we have these people step up, and, uh, but they've done it. And uh, we're, we're, we're accumulating a, a fair number of endowed chairs at Angelo State at that million dollar level. Well, it's individuals like that that you have cult cultivated and, and uh, it's a credit to your leadership that are making a difference at Angelo State. Thank you, sir. Future. I have no introductions, Mr. Chair. And I have no introductions, Mr. Chair. All right. The board will continue in open session and meet as a committee of the whole and a meeting of the board. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of the board meeting held on May 17th and 18th of 2018? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes. We will now consider items as a committee of the whole, and I would ask the vice chairman to preside over the committee of the whole. Regent Lancaster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The item is consideration of the consent agenda, items A through O, as listed on pages 1 through 28 of the agenda book, and the information agenda as listed on pages 29 through 34. Uh, if everyone would note that there is an amended version of items O that has been distributed this morning. This item relates to delegations of signature authority, and the re revisions today add one person to that list. So is there any discussion of the items in either the consent or the information agendas? As a reminder, if there's any item you'd like discussed in further detail or noted on separately from the consent <coughs> agenda, you may request that the item be moved to the committee of the whole agenda. Mr. Chairman, I move that the board approve the consent agenda as revised and acknowledge its review of the information agenda. Is there a second? Second. <coughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Regent Lancaster. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the items to be considered by the Committee of the Whole at this time. The board will continue meeting in open session to consider the reports of the standing committees. Regent Long, will you present items considered for action by the Audit Committee? Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, the Audit Committee of the Board met in open session on Thursday, August 9, 2018, and considered items 1 and 2 as presented on page A1 <laughs> through A4 of the agenda book. I request the following items be considered and approved. Item number 1, <coughs> uh, Texas Tech University System approved 2019 annual audit plan for the Texas Tech University System. Uh, uh, the committee also accepted the following report, uh, TT University System report on audits. Mr. Chairman, the Audit Committee also convened in an executive session at which no time, uh, at which time no action items were considered and approved. Mr. Chairman, the committee recommends approval of the items that are presented, and I so move. I have a second. second. 
We have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It carries. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the report of the Audit Committee. Regent Esparza, will you present items considered for action by the Facilities Committee? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, the Facilities Committee of the Board met in open session on Thursday, August the 9th, 2018, and considered items 1 through 9 as presented on pages F1 through F17 to the agenda book. I request the following items be considered and approved as a group. Item 1, ASU, approved concept and stage 1 budget for new Angelo State University Art Museum building. Item 1A, ASU, approved naming of the Centennial Village Residential Hall Complex. Item 2, TTU, approved Stage 2 budget for a renovation of Weeks Hall. Item 3, TTU, approved Stage 2 budget for a new athletic dining hall or a dining facility as revised. <clears throat> Item 4, TTU, approved concept and Stage 1 budget for Dairy Barn renovation project. Item 5, TTU, approved concept and Stage 1 budget for a proposed new School of Veterinary Medicine. Item 7, TTU HSC, approved naming of the pediatric waiting room at TTU HSC Amarillo campus. Item 8, TTU HSC El Paso, approved stage 2 budget for the new dental School of Dentistry Dental Learning Center. The committee also accepted the following report, which is item 9, TTU system, report on facilities planning and construction projects. And finally, the committee did not consider and took no action on the following item. That would have been item 6, TTU approved acceptance of gift in kind benefiting the Oilfield Technology Center. Mr. Chairman, the committee recommends approval of the following items and as presented and I so move. I have a second. Mr. Right. Chairman, uh, let the record show that I recuse myself on item two regarding Weeks Hall, please. Okay. Do I hear a second with that abstention? Second. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? That carries. Mr. Just, Chairman, this concludes the report of the Facilities Committee. Regent Steinmetz, please present items from the Finance and Administration Committee. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, the Finance and Administration Committee of the Board met in open session on Thursday, August 9th, 2018, to consider items 1 through 5 as presented on FA1 through FA8 of the agenda book. I request the following items be considered and approved. Item number 1, TTU ASU, TTU Health Science Center, TTU Health Science Center El Paso, and TTU System Administration, approve the fiscal year 2019 operating budgets. Item two, TTU, approve a contract with the City of Lubbock for bus services. Item three, TTU system, approve amendments to chapter five, student affairs and chapter eight, facilities of the Regents rules relating to traffic and parking regulations. Item four, approve the amendments to the investment policy statement for the short and intermediate term investment fund and related amendments to chapter nine, Regents rules as revised. Item five, TTU system, authorize the chancellor to execute a contract with STM Charters Incorporated. Mr. Chairman, the committee recommends the approval and I so move. Go we'll here, second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It carries, thank you. Mr. Chairman, this concludes the report of the Finance and Administration Committee. Regent Walker, will you present items considered for action by the Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Academic, Clinical, and Student Affairs Committee of the Board met in open session on Thursday, August 9, 2018, to consider items 1 through 12 as presented on pages ACS 1 through 22 of the agenda book. I request that all 12 of those items be considered and approved as a group. Do I hear a second? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It carries. Mr. Chairman, the committee recommends approval. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Thank you. We will continue meeting as a committee of the whole and a meeting of the board. Then please present the schedule of upcoming board meetings. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There are no changes in the scheduled uh, meetings. I would note, however, though, that our next meeting is in eight short weeks and at that meeting this year we will conduct the joint investments meeting involving the board of regents members of the investment advisory committee members of the texas tech foundation board executive committee and representatives of the angelo state foundation we will do that joint investments meeting at the october meeting rather than december we're going to do that thursday morning yes sir 
All right. Today we will be hearing from our president reports from Dr. May and Dr. Lang, plus all of our SGA presidents. We'll begin with our institutional presidents, Dr. May. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be before you this morning. And really, I'm just going to give a short, more or less, update on uh, our strategic initiatives at Angelo State. And uh, we'll start off with enrollment. Of course, we went through an incredible uh, increase in enrollment. And I think uh, both Martha Brown and uh, Angie Wright can tell you that uh, recently they just released what potentially could be the HEFA allocations for the next biennium. Some of the major increases were 3, 4, and 5 percent. Our increase was 24 percent. I had several calls from my colleagues in the Lone Star Conference wanting to know what I'd done. I said, well, I just kind of slipped that in. But uh, actually, uh, that was due to, our, due to our enrollment. We were hoping to have a windfall like that in the last session, but it's really going to work out well. And uh, uh, we, I think that that probably, and you know, the, the chancellor has, has educated us on that, that he funding is something you can rely on. That's something that doesn't go away. And I think that's important as we start to, when you talk about a strategic plan, to be able to have growth that, that has a concomitant increase in, in funding, that's when you can really uh, reap those benefits. We had a record enrollment of 10,417. We think we will be over that this fall. The numbers are still coming in. But uh, our retention rates have in, improved dramatically. And that's going to allow us, even with a flat freshman class, to increase enrollment, as well as uh, there will be a slight du dual credit increase as well. But our, our dual credit students are <coughs> graduating from high school are also increasing the number that are coming to Angelo State, and those funnels are starting to develop. And uh, I'm going to show you a video at the end of this. It's kind of an out-of-body experience. I'm kind of copying my colleagues now. <laughs> They finally forced me into it. I thought we should all just go paperless. I mean, poorly copying his colleagues. Else, but why not? Why not just speak from the cuff? We, we're presidents. But uh, but anyway, we're. But uh, so they finally melted me down, and I'm going to have some kind of media. So we we're going with it, and uh, the graduate student numbers we've we've experienced incredible growth over the last 10 years, but it is starting to level off as well. The other thing that we're very proud of, because it matches our demographics, is being a Hispanic-serving institution. And uh, we've been recognized in several different organizations across the country for our work in this area, and it continues to grow, which we're extremely proud of. And you all remember Jarrett Lujan, who was a predecessor to Jane. And, uh, you know, it's just we're, they're developing into leaders. We're, we're great students, and uh, we certainly have a, a culture there that benefits with HSI. And it's also helped us develop these new programs like engineering. And I would like to announce that this December, we will have our first three graduates of engineering at Angelo State University. And I'm very proud of that. It will be a monumental uh, level for us to reach. And to have an engineering graduates from ASU and, and an accredited engineering program at the same time is really important. I'd also like to announce that uh, with the help of the system, we were able to get a letter recently from the coordinating board that mechanical engineering is on track and will be approved at the October meeting of the coordinating board. That, too, is really important. It's a game changer for ASU. But uh, without the HSI grants, it would have been prob problematic. But we've had incredible support from the community in engineering and uh, certainly something that we think is important a big plus for us. Student success, and we're going to put uh, everything from retention rates to graduation rates in here, but our, our retention rate um, is, is down just a little bit from uh, last year, but uh, the fall to spring was, um, uh, that, I'm talking about our second year retention, but our fall to spring was the highest ever last year at 89.1 percent, and then our we're still trying to get to that 70%, but I think we are actually going to get to 70% retention rate this fall. That will be monumental for us, too. And uh, we did uh, do a lot here in the last few months to really push that, to make sure kids got in. And, but 
as you can see by those graphs, we're on a great trajectory. And, you know, as we go along, too, we're going to look at admission standards and probably raise those in the near future. And that, too, but if you can do, do that with a concomitant of retention success, it, it bodes well for the entire university. But our four-year graduation rate also reached 30 percent, which is the highest in our history. And that, that's, uh, that's something that was kind of a milestone for us. Certainly, we lag way behind what Texas Tech is doing, but uh, we, we do want to aspire to be at their levels as well. Our five-year five -year graduation rate also is the highest ever, and our six-year graduation rate, we still have one or two uh, lagging classes in there that's pulled it down, but that, too, is going to jump next year. If we look at our average time to bachelor's degree, you see that continues to come down. We're at 4.4 years. Our graduation rate for our two-year transfers is, is, continues to increase. And something that's kind of unique is our, we, we also track graduating in three years. And you can see there in 2018, it, it, it still creeps up. And of course, that's due to the dual credit that they have when they re, uh, come to ASU. We have several <coughs> students each year that are graduating with two years. And because they, come as pretty much with an associate's degree uh, to Angelo State. And this is certainly bodes well. And you know, if you look at what the, what the state is trying to do by decreasing the debt, the college debt of the student, dual credit is the answer to it. Dual credit where they bring that almost to an associate's degree and uh, in working with the commissioner of higher education, we're, we're really pushing that point at the coordinating board to understand that this is, this is more of the norm and it's something that we're going to be able to, to cling on to. And finally, I want to talk about development. Uh, there's some real stars in this system. And uh, I would say that probably Ted thinks, when we think about Ted's development with Kendra Burris at Texas Tech, uh, T Andrea Tyree, at Langelo State, we have Jamie Aiken. And I give her full credit. I know I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. You give me credit for those endowed chairs. But certainly the development office and Jamie Aiken is nothing short of amazing. We continue to lead regional institutions, not only in Texas, but the southwestern U.S. in comparing in case studies. And this year has been nothing uh, short of amazing. And uh, the amount of money that we raise, it says $26.8 million. Um, but really it's closer to 29 million. We just got an, another significant gift for a chapel to be built on campus. Um, it's our largest fundraising in the history. And uh, I continually tell uh, the chancellor, well, next year we won't be able to raise 500,000. And I can tell you right now, I don't know where any money's gonna come from next year, <laughs> but it will appear. And uh, it just does. And uh, you know, and it's, it's come, about the time I think we've completely worn out all of our donors, a new ones step up. And uh, I'm just, and Mickey is one of them too, one of our biggest donors and continues to help us. And, uh, but that, that's, that's something that we're very, very proud of and being able to do that. And uh, the majority of this money has gone to academics, but we have, completely renovated all of our athletic facilities at no cost to students whatsoever. We did not raise our athletic fee to pay for these uh, venues. It was all by private funds. And I will note, add too, Mr. Chairman, that we, we named two chairs and a facility this meeting with no controversy. And uh, <laughs> I, I really believe y'all are finally coming around to my way of thinking. And, uh, we, I mean, development, sky's the limit if y'all do that. And, uh, but uh, I think that wow. uh, we, we kind of digging my own hole here. But, uh, <laughs> this is why you don't speak but, from the car. But yeah. we, are, we are a team. We are a team. And uh, I can tell you it, it's, it's something that we're proud of and we're, we're excited to be a part of it in development. Uh, continues to be, it's a business. It really is. It's, it's a profession, and the people who do it well, you just can't give enough accolades to. 
And uh, I certainly want to give that to Jamie Aiken and her team and what they've been able to accomplish. Another thing that we're very proud of is uh, the Chronicle of Higher Education does this survey across all the universities in the country. And um, it's called a great college to work for. And there's 12 criteria. And uh, if you get three, you're considered a great college to work for, which is kind of a low bar. We have had 11 out of 12 as positive for the last four years in a row. And we're the only state school on the honor roll in the state of Texas. So I'm very proud of that. I think it's, uh, it's something that we strive for, but the Ram family is not a slogan. It's part of our culture. And we try to make sure that every employee, as well as our students, know that we care. And I think that's part of our success. I know it's part of our success, what we've been able to accomplish in retention, graduation rates, even development. So with that, that's my report. Would you, uh, President May, tell them about the event tonight and the growth of uh, the Blue and Gold it's, event? The Blue and Gold Banquet is, is incredible. Uh, it's, it's a banquet, a fundraiser. It's a silent auction, live auction. This year, we sold 94 tables, and we have a waiting list of tables. We couldn't sell them a table for this year, but they, we're selling them a table for next year. There'll be over 800 people at this event. I told my wife, I don't think they have enough to do in San Angelo. But, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's fellowship. Uh, Regent Long has been to it. The Chancellor's been to it. it it's, a, it's a lot of fun. We'll raise well in excess of $200,000 tonight. But the amount of friends that we raise are even more important. One thing that we're doing um, that I'm going to end up here. I told you I had a video. I almost forgot it until it came up. Uh, I kind of, I was on a high note. I kind of like to sit down, but, uh, but I, uh, this video was created and this, every single student that's admitted to ASU will get this video, but it has their name in it. Now, since I'm kind of reinventing myself, we put Brian, I started to put Rick there, but that, too much pandering. So I just decided we'd, we'd go with Brian, and uh, but if y'all would play this video for us, put it on screen. There you go. Turn it up. Theirs is right there. Oh, well, that's right. Your room is actually ready to go. Project leaders, grab your materials and, and come on down.
But anyway, that's every single student that submitted ASU will get that with their personal nice name, and uh, that's done by a, a young man that's a, a, actually shooting movies in California, but he's an alum, and uh, he does all our videos. So, oh, great, job. Yeah, great job. Is there any questions? All right, thank you. thank you. Great report. Thank you, Brian. Dr. Lang, will you please try and top that? <laughs> I don't know that you can, but uh, well, I, that was pretty amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Brian, you, you, you've upped your game, I have to admit, number one. I'm telling you. Number well, I don't two. want to set a low bar. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was, I'm unable to uh, introduce you to our new ABC for Institutional Advancement. We won't, won't start till Monday. I'm happy to announce it's Jamie Aiken. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You can't afford her. <laughs> no, I thought what I'd do is spend a little bit of time. We we're supposed to talk about updating our strategic plan. I wanted to, again, thank the Board of Regents for the support of the Woody Hill Hunt School of Dental Medicine. I want to talk just a little bit about the feasibility of why we're doing this. Um, and uh, you have the feasibility report in front of you, um, and I'll not go into all the details. But uh, just to mention that our goal is to improve the oral health of, of the people of Texas and the greater El Paso community. And, and we're doing that for f with four aspects in mind. First of all, El Paso County has been designated, not only recently, but for a long time, as a dental health professional shortage area by the U.S. Health Resources and Services Administration. And that's with regard to all health care providers. But in particular, the, the, the shortage of dentists is particularly acute. And El Paso County, or El Paso population, although fifth largest in the state of Texas, is in the 19th largest city of the United States. And let me point to some figures that illustrate this. And what's shown on the left-hand side is the state of Texas, colored from dark blue to white. And it indicates the number of general dentists there are per county. And the darker the area, the more gen general dentists. You can obviously see El Paso out in West Texas, and by everything outside of El Paso, we consider East Texas, by the way. So, but what you can see is where I've drawn the area is where Lubbock and El Paso and most of West Texas is, is affected by the shortage of dentists. Now, across the U.S., there are about one dentist for every 2,000 individuals. In the state of Texas, it's about one per 3,000, and in El Paso, it's one for every 5,500 people. Now, what that means is if everybody in El Paso decided they were going to have the, the rec follow the recommendation, that is to see a dentist once a year, every dentist in El Paso would be seeing 104 patients every week. That's, un that's not possible at all. A and to, to, again, put some numbers on it, for every 100,000 people across the United States, there are 48 dentists. The state of Texas has a 25% shortage. The state of El, and the city of El Paso has a 56% shortage in terms of dentists. And why that's important is we think, well, that's just dental care. It's getting your teeth clean. But what's become evidence over the last two decades since I trained is that dental disease causes a chronic inflammatory state. And there are very few things that do that. You can get that with severe rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease, some autoimmune disease, essentially Dental disease is an autoimmune disease. And when you have dental disease, it increases your risk of heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, cancer, and stroke, the leading causes of death in El Paso and across the United States. Now, I must say, 20 years ago when we talked about this, we thought, it's crazy. How does dental disease cause that? But it's that chronic inflammatory state. Now, that's in, in our population, but in high school kids, it's a, it's a leading cause of kids not being in school, it's a leading cause of malnutrition and a leading cause of academic performance. So oral health is important. Now, one of the things I didn't realize until I started preparing for this, I looked at the site, the American Dental Education Association site. By the way, I'm a member of the American Dental Education Association, the only cardiologist in the United States that's in IDEA. <laughs> and uh, it also affects our troop readiness. Now, many of you that were, uh, uh, around at the time where there was a draft are familiar with the 4F. The 4F designation means you weren't allowed to participate because of a medical condition. That arose from the Civil War for people that missed their four front teeth, 
for F because they couldn't open the gunpowder to be involved, all right? You'd think that was in the Civil War. In 2008, 96% of people that were recruited by the Department of Defense had some sort of dental care, and half of them weren't eligible to be deployed because of that. You say, whoa, is that true? It's sitting right there. In fact, the most qual common disqualifier for military service in the 20th century wasn't flat feet, it was poor dental disease. So what, af what afflicts us affects chronic disease, it affects kids, it even affects our readiness in terms of the Department of De Defense. Now, we plan to address the dental provider shortage in El Paso and West Texas to impact the disparities in access to care in urban, rural, border, and non-border regions and to provide opportunities for qualified students in Texas to attend dental school in Texas. Now, we have three outstanding dental schools. They rank in the top 10 dental schools in the United States. And by the way, there are 66 dental schools in the United States. And the schools in, El schools in San Antonio and Dallas and Houston, which have been around between 50 and 100 years. The last dental school was in San Antonio. It opened in 1969, admitted the first students in 1970. And they graduate 300 students per year, 100 per class. And those students that graduate do what we like. They stay in Texas. And in fact, 86% of the Texas dental school students who graduated since 2007 currently practice in the state of Texas. We invest in those students, and they stay in Texas. The unfortunate thing is where they stay is where they train at. So 75% of the Texas school graduates establish a practice in proximity to where they train. So where are the most of the dentists? They're in San Antonio, they're in Houston, and they're in Dallas. In fact, the ratio of dentists per capita is highest among Texas counties that actually have a dental school. So where does that leave us? Well, in El Paso, we don't have very many dentists coming here, and I'll, I'll point that out. But ha having said that, and you could, what's shown on the graph, on the bottom line is the number of dental students enrolled over the last 15 years. And you can see it's, it's remained relatively flat. The number of students that have applied have increased about 70%, from about 500 to almost 1,000. And you see, we're, we're, we're not enrolling 665 students. These are people that are potentially eligible for dental school that don't make it in because we haven't increased the population. So we have an adequate number of people applying, and that's increasing every year. What happened last year in 2017, we graduated 300 dental students. And where they set up practice is shown here. Again, the darker, line, the darker counties indicate more dentist, dental students uh, residing there after they've graduated. And what you can see is in West Texas, it's all white, except for five counties. And by the way, those five counties had one to four dentists of the 300 actually end up residing. So all of West Texas isn't, the needs aren't being met from the current uh, graduates from San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. Now that's just last year. If I show you the last 9,180 dental graduates from the state of Texas and where they end up practicing, and that's shown here, they end up practicing in the Metroplex, in the Gulf Coast, or South Texas. That is, they end up practicing in Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. And shown at the bottom left, the upper Rio Grande Valley, for the last 20 years, 1.2% of the graduates end up in the upper Rio Grande Valley and 1.4% in West Texas, 2.6%. Now, the last dental school came aboard in 1970. There were 11.2 million people in Texas in 1970. There are now 28.3 million people in the state of Texas. It's increased 17 million. We're not putting out more dental students. In El Paso, the population in 1970, 392,251. Now, 500,000 more people, but we're not increasing the number of dentists. So hence, the need for the dental school. Furthermore, the dental graduates really don't mimic what's happening in El Paso and West Texas. I'm proud of the fact, by the way, that Lawrence has HSI designation and Brian has Hispanic Serving Institution designation. We just also received HSI designation. Of the 175 medical schools across the nation, only two that now have HSI designation, and we are one of those. We can apply because of our SACS accreditation. And the students who are currently graduating, they're terrific dentists. They're mostly Caucasian, very few Hispanic dentists graduating from the state of Texas. 
Nevertheless, my county, 80% Hispanic. Now, the language barriers, the cultural barriers, understanding and meeting those needs is incredibly important. That will provide us an opportunity to recruit students from West Texas to get them to stay in West Texas. Now, compounding the fact that, that we're not populating West Texas with very many dentists from the other dental schools is the fact that we have an aging workforce. Now, I don't want to say they're old, they're elderly, but I would say they're approaching retirement. And that is the 172 general dentists we have in El Paso, over 100 or over the age of 55 right now. So unless we meet this need, as the population of El Paso grows, and it's supposed to pass 1 million over the next several years, it's going to be a significant issue. The history suggests that at the Paul L. Foster School of Medicine, we do a terrific job of recruiting individuals that are from our area. About 25% of the medical students come from the El Paso area. About 87% of the Gale Grief Hunt School of Nursing students are from the El Paso area. And in our Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, between 60 and 70% are from the El Paso area as well. So our mission is to improve the oral health of the people of Texas and the greater El Paso community by focusing on our unique oral and overall health care needs of the border population, to demonstrate excellence in education, research, and patient care, and provide leadership to the practice and community and other stake area, area stakeholders. The education, I want to stress that. I just want to spend just a moment talking about that because the establishment of the Paul L. Foster School of Medicine gave us the opportunity to provide a unique dental curriculum like no, other no, like no other medical school across the United States. And it has been cited as being one of the most innovative curriculums. We're able to take that and fold that into the dental school as well. If you haven't had a new dental school in the last 50 to 100 years, you haven't had a new curriculum. And what we, what we know now, the way we learn is very different. 50 years ago, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers. We didn't have digital education. We didn't have many of the electronic and digital devices we use in dental care now. So we're organizing uh, that curriculum already. Now, this has been a very complicated process. It involves parallel evaluations, or, or actually I say parallel uh, accreditations. Shown on the left in green is what we've done for SACS COC to become a separate institution. And what we'll need to do in terms of advancing the dental school. Shown in blue is what we're doing for the Higher Education Coordinating Board. And shown is, it, in orange is what we'll be doing for the Commission on Dental Accreditation. Over the course of 2017 through 2025, and it's very scripted as we know exactly what needs to be done. We've already obtained separate SACS COC accreditation as an institution. And by the way, we now have to apply for a separate program for dental school. The Higher Education Coordinating Board approval is awaiting you all to approve us to go forward. Now that we have that, we'll be submitting uh, to the Higher Education Coordinating Board in November of this year our proposal <coughs> for, the de for the dental school. We're looking for approval in 2019 to recruit the first students in 2020 and to enroll them in 2021. And concomitant with that, the Commission on Dental Accreditation requires us to have blueprints for what the school learning center will look like. We have those. You guys approved those already. It requires our curriculum that you can see that we're already performing. So when 2021 comes, our plans to, to, are to admit the first students. So again, uh, our conclusion is that the analysis demonstrates there's a significant need in El Paso and West Texas. We have the job market, we have the people that can fill that need, and we have a student interest in the fourth dental school in Texas. This will be the first school in Texas in 50 years, as I mentioned, and the only one on the U.S.-Mexico border. And our success in recruiting individuals from West Texas and from El Paso to meet that need suggests we'll be able to do <coughs> the same thing for the dental school. Now, it's not nearly as sexy. I didn't have a video. I didn't want to make upstage <laughs> Brian. In fact, Brian didn't tell Ted and I he was having a video. Ted and I are going to be doing some rapping next time. I want to let you know, Brian. You want to get <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot wait. <laughs> but I, I want to thank uh, the Board of Regents for recognizing the need, not only in West Texas, but in El Paso. The way the school was set up, the medical school, the dental school, the graduate school. Now the dental school will be looking at allied health in the future, and I want to thank the Board for allowing us to be good stewards of the resources that you offer us to meet those needs. Thank you. Can I ask you one question? Yes, sir. Uh, the different dental schools across the country, the, how many students apply and don't get in? Are there a bunch of people wanting to be dentists and they just can't get into dental schools? Yes, sir. The admission rate's about 40%. Thank you. I, I want to say something also. I, I think that tech 
over time has had uh, a lot of initiatives. And uh, I think that one of the criticisms, at least from this board, was that, that we hadn't done a very good job of, of uh, really understanding all the aspects of it. And I do think that you provided a blueprint for all initiatives that follow in terms <coughs> of what you've done for the dental school. We, we've had a business plan, we've had financials, and we've had a timeline. And that's exactly what we need uh, in terms of everything that we do uh, to understand it. And uh, I really appreciate how you've done it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lang. We'll next hear from our student government presidents and Shana, is it Shana Mullen? Mm -hmm. All right, would you please come up and tell us about Angelo State? Actually, President Mullen, sir. President Mullen. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. I am Shana Mullen. I am the president for the 90th session of student government at ASU. With me today, I have my vice president, Brayden Woods. Um, he is a junior this year, and he actually spent the last three months in D.C. interning for Congressman Conaway. And even though he was in D.C. doing all of that, he still helped me with just the details of student government over the summer. So I'm really grateful to have him as my partner this year. Um, I am a senior this year. I will be graduating in May. I am pre-law. I will have my degree in history and political science. And I am the second of my parents' children that actually in our family to graduate college. My sister graduated back in May, and she was the first person to graduate college, and then I'll be the first one to go to graduate school. So my parents are super proud, and she actually applied for a job at ASU, and she interviewed and everything like that. We both bleed blue and gold, and it's, it's great. I love Angelo State, and I'm really excited for everything that I can do for student government this year. So, so far for the summer and in our initiatives and our programs, we have a huge freshman population coming in. And so we've been able to, I've been participating in the new student orientations, getting them acclimated on campus, registering for classes. RAM Roundup is a little camp that we do for our freshmen and they go and they um, really bond with one another and they really get into the spirit of being a future RAM and the next four years of their lives. And then Rambunctious Weekend is exciting. It's about a four day event that we put on when the students come in and all of the organizations on campus participate in it and there's just, their day is packed with stuff that they can do. I believe like Greek Life puts on flag football and there's laser tag and student government's doing a luau pool party and I, there's even going to be a Fortnite tournament that's going on. <laughs> so that's going to be a lot of fun. One of the initiatives that I'm really proud of that hopefully we can get going, there is a company based off in Wisconsin called Rent College Pads. They work with universities all across the country and they reached out to me and because we are growing so much at Angelo State University, a lot of our students live off campus. And Rent College Pads, what they do is they help students find affordable off-campus housing. So they'll have like a website set up. Um, we're, dealing, we're working with the contract right now that's in the process. And um, they'll have a website linked up to our website. And students can go on there and then landlords post college-friendly, affordable um, leases that they can offer to our students. And that's going to help them tremendously finding off-campus housing, which is I'm really excited for. And then, of course, our student discount program is always expanding. Um, Michael LaBarca, our parliamentarian, he is the head of the student discount program. He works with our PR committee. And we have over 120 businesses around San Angelo that offer discounts to students. And our future initiatives is, of course, the water filtration fountains that we are currently working towards getting in all of the buildings on campus. Because if you've ever had a glass of San Angelo tap water, you will understand that filtration fountains <laughs> are very much needed. <laughs> and so, like and then Ram Jam <laughs> is our tailgate. So Brayden and I were able to set up a round table with the Alumni Center who puts on, who hosts our tailgates essentially for our football. Um, games and we were able to get different leaders of different organizations on campus that participate in our tailgates and have them collaborate with the 
um, Alumni Center to give them feedback of what they feel like would better our tailgates, because you can always, always improve school spirit, and you could always get people amped up for Angelo State University. And we were able to give them really helpful feedback, and they were able to come back to us and say, yes, we can do these things. So I'm really excited for the Ram Jams that are coming up. Um, starting in September for our football games and the students are super excited and they should be packed this year and hopefully we can just get the football stadium packed and really build up that school spirit for Angelo State University. The bicycle rental is something that one of my senators has kind of thrown around. I have created a transportation committee in the student government and that's going to deal with any form of transportation that fills students needs so like our shuttle and our bus system, our bus shuttle, and then the bike rental is something that our senator feels like international students, because we have a huge international population, um, can use. You basically just rent out a bike and you're able to just ride it around either campus or ride it around town, and that offers them a means of transportation. And we're gonna hopefully get that going this session, work out all the details, and then starting next session, it's up and running. So that's what we're really working towards. The Christmas tree lighting is one of my favorite times of the year. The uh, community in San Angelo really comes out and they really get involved with the Angelo State organizations and the students and it's a big event and what we're, our goal, my goal, is to not, is just to make it bigger and get the buildings, not just the Christmas tree and the trees around it, but the buildings lit up with Christmas lights this year and just make sure just fill the Christmas spirit at Angelo State University and then our Environment, Health and Sports Committee. If we can do that, they want to have a night run and it's lit up by Christmas lights and it's just going to be really great for the community to be involved in and really build up the RAM spirit around <laughs> Angelo State University. Veterans Appreciation, um, so the month of November, one of our senators would like SGA to dedicate the month of November to Veterans Appreciation because we are a military friendly uh, institution and we have a veterans office and we have two veteran seats for student government. Um, so they sit in on the Senate and we have a veterans population so we would like to dedicate the month of November to Veterans Appreciation. And then of course, the student discount program is always growing so I always like to talk about that. Um, thank you so much for y'all's time and for listening and it was brief but I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you. John Lewis, you present for Texas Tech University. Thank you, Chairman Francis, members of the board, Chancellor Duncan, President Skubinek, and Provost Galleon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address you here today again. Um, so this summer, I've had the privilege to welcome each and every uh, incoming freshman uh, that have attended uh, our Red Rider orientation along with their, their parents and, and loved ones. Uh, and it's been an exciting time to see uh, how excited they are to be on campus, uh, to see the beautiful, our beautiful campus and the programs that we have for them. Um, in addition to that, we've signed freshmen up for our first year engagement programs. And what that looks like is uh, freshmen have the opportunity to intern with members of the executive branch of the Student Government Association learn how it works, learn um, our process and, and how to go about meeting with members of our administration. And then they also have another option with freshman council in which they are elected uh, by their housing complex and two representatives are elected to serve the freshman class um, and our students in it. So we've had over 350 students sign up for our first year engagement programs, which we are really excited. I think it's the most that we've had in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, and we are, um, anticipating getting them signed up for student government uh, so they can serve their, their campus and their freshman class. Um, this, upcoming, uh, this upcoming month, we are going down to Cedar Canyon for our annual student government retreat uh, in which we will train our senators, our members of cabinet executive branch on uh, our strategic initiatives for this upcoming year and uh, working with them to uh, get in touch with the right people, understand the processes that we go through um, on campus uh, so we can have the most efficient and effective year uh, for our Red Raider students. Um, so we're going down to Cedar Canyon in Happy, Texas, um, and we are really excited for that opportunity to train uh, our student government uh, association officers and members and just to come together and get to know each other after the long summer break. 
And just a few updates on the initiatives that I briefed you all and, and updated you all on last time. Uh, food trucks on campus, that is something that we are excited about. We submitted a proposal uh, within the uh, Student Government Association. We had the opportunity to meet with Transportation and Parking Services, and we are going, going to continue to submit that to uh, the appropriate uh, 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 stakeholders on campus. Um, we are excited about this opportunity to just provide more food options for our students, a mobile way uh, of student uh, food coming in and off campus. Undergraduate research, we've identified some ways uh, in which we can educate uh, undergraduate students on research. Like I've said at the last board meeting, when we think of research, we think of lab coats and test tubes, or at least I do. Um, so if there is a way that we can um, provide a list of opportunities for undergraduate research that students can take advantage of, uh, we're looking, looking, looking into that as well. Mental health awareness, this is something that I'm uh, really thrilled about. We, I just had a meeting yesterday with our uh, risk intervention safety education uh, de department and we are partnering with that department uh, for suicide prevention week in which we're gonna ha have a round table with student leaders and educate them on some of the key factors and indicators that someone may uh, be struggling going through something. And we're also looking to train, um, get our senators and our members trained and be uh, QPR are certified and trained as well. Um, and just be proactive about the resources that we have on campus, the resources that we have uh, off campus as well, so students can get the help and support that they need. And then in student engagement and inclusion, uh, we're excited to uh, be proactive and work with our administration and uh, Dr. Sumner that you were introduced to earlier uh, this meeting uh, to educate our students on uh, how we can share uh, and highlight our Red Raider values and come together. And that is going to take place in the form of a town hall. Uh, we're looking to host two town halls this upcoming semesters and uh, where we will talk about the issues that are important to Red Raiders and how we can just come together and highlight the fact that we're first and foremost Red Raiders before we are among any different student organizations or demographics. So with that being said, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Wonderful. Thank you for your work on mental health and recognizing that the need applies to people of all ages and all uh, 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 at stages of their life. Students need mental health help as much as anybody and more so in some studies that we see. So thank you guys for working on that. Absolutely, Regent Hammonds. We're also identifying, um, are there certain classes, whether it's freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors, or graduate students that uh, we, they, we see a need more than other demographics? So uh, looking to serve all um, aspects of Red Raiders on campus as well, but I thank you for your comment. We'll encourage you to do more and you encourage us to do more, okay? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, Brooke Waltersheed. Some creative pronunciations of that. Okay, so again, my name is Brooke Waltershed. I'll be serving as president for the upcoming year. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak to, speak to you here today. Um, we did a lot of work over the summer, a lot of plotting, planning, brainstorming for the upcoming year, seeing how we can make the T2HSC a better place for students. Um, so we outlined four main goals for the upcoming year, and I'll be going through the details of what each of these entail in the coming slides. So first, we would like to enhance SGA's visibility to students and faculty. We, we will be doing this by presenting to student groups and program orientations. Just this week, our Vice President of Operations, Elizabeth Cook, spoke to the entire School of Nursing. I also spoke to the incoming School of Medicine class and um, just kind of telling them what SGA is about, getting them involved early and aware early. Um, we will also be presenting to the School of Health Professions at the end of the month. So we will have presented to almost half of our student population just this month alone before classes even start. Next, we will be having monthly emails sent to students highlighting services and events sponsored by SGA. So September's letter, once everyone's started in class, will focus on student wellness. We will be highlighting our new Tranquility Room, which is located in the library. This is basically a space for students to kind of step away from their studies to pray, meditate, just look for a tranquil moment um, when life gets a little hectic. And we're just working to promote the mental and spiritual health of our students. And we'll also include information about our program of assistance for students in providing mental health services and talk therapy sessions to them. 
Next, we'll be conducting a social media campaign. We will be illustrating values-based practices, as I will detail in the next slide. And we'll also be including a spotlight on senators to ensure that all of our students recognize who their representatives are and to put faces with names. Next, we'll be promoting a values-based culture among students. This summer, we met with our chief people officer, um, Mr. Steve Sosland, and talked over how we can kind of disseminate this practice into our student body. We'll be training our senators on values-based practices and this upcoming semester. We'll be encouraging senators and also other student organization <coughs> leaders to take the values pledge. Ideally, at the culmination of all of our work, we would like to create a student-led recruitment video illustrating our values-based culture. More so, we are seeing that students are not only considering who their faculty are, what research opportunities um, are held by their school, but also what the student culture is like. Is this a place where I can grow and thrive and become my best professional self? And also, we would like to potentially host sessions for students to discuss the application of values with faculty and peers, again, sort of ingraining those values into our everyday culture. Next, we'll be renovating the Synergistic Center to accommodate student needs. The Synergistic Center is basically just our student space. It's where people study, sometimes take naps on the couches, um, uh, study, eat, do whatever they need to do uh, throughout the day. And it's become such a popular space that uh, we don't have enough tables and enough seating to accommodate everyone. <laughs> so we'll be increasing the number of seats and tables within the center. Also, we need to make power outlets accessible for every table. Um, most of our lectures and study materials are on our computers. And so if you don't have the power outlets, then you're not getting your studying done. And um, if we have any remaining funds, we would like to pull our students on how to best use those whether it's printing services, including charging cables, things of that nature. To ensure that all of this is kept in tip-top shape, we will be conducting weekly walkthroughs by our operations committee members, <laughs> making sure um, our printers are working, our microwaves are working, um, et cetera. We'll also be creating an accessible online form for students to submit any maintenance needs so that nothing um, is left unnoticed. And next, we'll be promoting leadership development amongst senators. We'll be hosting a leadership conference for local and regional SGA senators in the month of October. We hope to invite a speaker from the Rawls College of Business Area of Management, someone particularly with expertise in the areas of leadership and ethics. And we'll also be hosting roundtable discussions on values-based practices, and hopefully we can take some of the material discussed in this session and put it toward that recruitment video. We also want to empower senators to act on their own ideas for change and utilize the power of student legislation. We will be doing this by hosting a senator retreat. It's something that hasn't always been done in the past and I believe will make the year more productive where we go over how to write legislation, how to contact administration, uh, fund, funding processes, things of that nature to equip our senators with the tools that they need uh, to enact proper change that they wish to see. And again, here are our year's officers. And do I have any questions? Great, thank you all so much. Thank you, Brooke, great report. Saeed Ilani, please present TTU HSC El Paso. Thank you, guys. Um, just first, I just wanna say thank you for letting me present again. Uh, my name's Sajid. I'm going to be serving as the president for this year for uh, TTU HSC El Paso. So first of all, it's an exciting time of year. Um, we have new students coming. The medical students started a couple weeks ago. Um, the graduate students are gonna be starting in a couple days, and then the nursing students will be starting in the next couple weeks. Um, and this is actually a picture from the white coat ceremony for this year's uh, medical school class. It happened about two weeks ago. I mean, what that is, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it comes at the end of the immersion program. Um, which part of the immersion program is a community assessment where students go out in groups to various communities in the El Paso area and look to see what can we do to positively impact the community. Um, and then they'll come amongst themselves as peers and vote on what they think are the best uh, interventions. So this year the winning group was actually a group that went to the Fabens community um, and they basically came up with an intervention to address uh, issues with water quality in the area and we're excited because we're going to be incorporating that into our Martin Luther King uh, junior day of service in the spring. Um, so that's very exciting for us. And in addition, we actually <coughs> had a special guest to some of the lectures during immersion. Uh, <clears throat> we had Dr. Black, the dean of the dental school. He came and sat in on a couple of lectures 
um, and he talked to some of the faculty afterwards and he was really excited about the immersion program and actually wants to incorporate some of the dental, incorporate the dental students if possible in some way into the immersion program, which to me I personally find that exciting um, because it's really about giving back to the community. Um, and then also the first year students actually just had their SARP orientation this past week, which is their scholarly activity research project. Um, so they should hopefully be joining the, our research community soon, uh, which is growing and will continue to grow with the addition of the dental school and also with the new medical sciences building that we have coming. Um, and then I just wanted to say, talk briefly about our, the White Coat Sponsorship Program, which is hosted by the Office of Institutional Advancement. Every year they, um, they have this program and you know, we were able, they were able to get all 100 plus White Coats sponsored again. Um, and as a student, you know, personally I appreciate, I can speak for all students when I say we appreciate the community um, because it shows us that we do have their backing. Um, and their support, and that's part of the reason why we, you know, enjoy giving back to them so much. Um, and of course, I would love to rec uh, recognize the sponsors. Um, there are people from the El Paso community, there are people from all across the country who do support us, so I just wanted to publicly recognize them. Um, we actually are going to be having our welcome event in a couple of weeks, so all the students will be on campus. Um, we're going to be hosting lounge games for the new students and their families. Um, you know, of course, we're going to have food, and basically this is just uh, a, a chance for the new students to get to know each other from all three schools, uh, Texas Tech, El Paso, and um, for them to build friendships because it's on these friendships that we can bring, we can build strong professional working relationships. And then uh, last but not least, we have our Corazon de Oro. Um, it's our largest day of service at TTUHAC El Paso. We have the date scheduled for September 15th. Um, we are visiting a lot of the same sites that we have visited in the past, and in addition, we expanded to a couple of new sites, including the YWCA um, and also the Opportunity Center for the Homeless. And again, you know, we, our community is the reason we exist, um, and so we love to go and give back to them. And uh, we also decided to partner with some of the community clinics that students already volunteer at, um, because those are people, those are, you know, organizations that we have volunteered with in the past, um, and they, they play such a pivotal role to providing health care to people who have no access to health care at all. Um, and you know, students already volunteer there to help, help those organizations, but we just wanted to boost that even more. So we're gonna be working with some of the, the clinics in the El Paso area as well. Um, and that's it for me, if you guys have any questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and Board, I'd like to highlight and commend the leadership that these presidents and their officers have demonstrated. In the first few months of their terms, um, they have risen to the challenges and unique situations their offices have brought to the, to the officers. I applaud your work in these first few months of their terms. Good job and keep up the good work. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Lancaster, please, please present the motions regarding items discussed in executive session. Mr. Chairman, there are four items, uh, action items, that are resulting out of executive session. Um, motion number one, I move that President Skubinek be authorized to conclude the negotiations and execute revised employment agreements with the head coaches of certain Texas Tech University athletic programs to include Coach Tim Tadlock, Coach Wes Kitley, and Coach uh, Greg Sands under the terms and conditions set forth in executive session. Motion number two, having determined that revised employment agreements with the presidents of Angelo State University, Texas Tech University Health Science Center, Texas Tech University Health Science Center El Paso, and Texas Tech University are in the best interest of the institutions, I move that the chancellor be authorized to conclude the negotiations and execute a revised employment agreement with Dr. Brian May, Dr. Ted Mitchell, Dr. Richard Lang, and Dr. Lawrence Skuvenek under the terms and conditions set forth in executive session. Motion number three, I move that the board authorize President Lang to conclude the negotiations and execute the purchase documents for the properties in El Paso as identified in executive session under the terms and conditions set forth in executive session. And the last motion, I move that the board authorize President Lang to conclude the negotiations and execute an extension of a lease for real property in El Paso under the terms and conditions set forth in executive session. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
carries. Mr. Chairman, there is no action of any kind to be taken on the remaining items posted for and discussed in executive session. Thank you. Any other announcements from the Board of Regents? I hear a motion to adjourn the meeting at 9.43. So move. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned. <laughs>